We got Brian in Houston, Texas. Thanks for waiting. Hey, how are y'all doing? Good, Pretty thank good. you. Matt, I hope you feel better soon. Uh, I wanted to ask Thanks. you about your response to the fine-tuning argument. Um, so in your debate with Blake Genta. Yeah, you emailed uh, me you today me or yesterday, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, you give Blake 13 cards, and they all turn up to be spades, and you say um, on the hypothesis that you had cheated that that would be more likely. Mm-hmm. Um, and Blake Blake agrees and says, um, he says, that's evidence that you're cheating but not proof. And you agree. You say, we haven't determined anything about whether or not I actually cheated, but it's more likely on the hypothesis that I did cheat. So my question is, um, if you're going to argue that fine-tuning is analogous to the deck of cards and then say, but with the deck of cards, you know, if you have 13 spades and things line up like that, but that's evidence of cheating. Um, if the two things are analogous, then doesn't that imply that with the fine tuning, you also think that's evidence of cheating or agency intervention? The, you might not think it's conclusive proof, but wouldn't that uh, be evidence? Well, yes, but there's a couple things that are different. First of all, um, evidence for a proposition is, is separate from sufficient evidence to warrant a conclusion. So, you can have one little piece of evidence that would be consistent with the hypothesis, but that is not enough to, to conclude reasonably that that hypothesis is the most likely answer. Um, in the case of, of, okay. the, of the cards, we're looking at an outcome that we are attributing significance to. And in the case of the universe, we are doing the same thing. Right. We are, this, this universe is significant because it's important to us. There's nothing about it uh, that is intrinsically significant. And when we sure. look around and we see what appears to be design, we are making a conclusion about a like, what the likely explanation for the appearance of design. Uh, but the appearance of design is not necessarily design. And things can appear designed when they're not. And this is where it differs from the cards. Obviously, if I'm dealing out cards in front of somebody, um, you know, we know that there's an agent involved who is capable. We don't know that for sure. the universe. So like any other analogy, it's going to fall apart at some point. The purpose was to show that just because we find a significant result and we see the appearance of design that might make people suspicious about design, that does not mean that we have sufficient evidence to conclude that design is the most likely answer. I have a question. Okay, so I mean, Oh, Can ahead. I just ask a question? Oh, actually, it's a question sure. for Matt, because I'm not familiar with the context of the example that you're giving, so I just have a quick question for Matt. Sure. So, okay. like, let's say that I have a deck of cards and Matt has a deck of cards. We each have a full deck. And mm -hmm. I deal out 13 random cards out of my deck. And then Matt has to deal 13 cards out of his deck. Wouldn't, even though my, my 13 cards are random, wouldn't it be just as significant if he dealt 13 random cards that matched my cards? And they wouldn't be all spades. They'd just be random cards. But wouldn't it be amazing if he just started turning his cards and it turned out to be the same exact cards I had just turned? Right. And in, in, that, um, in that example, I mean, I, I would agree that it's likely that Matt had prearranged the deck. Right. But here's to... my thing. What if I didn't have a deck and I didn't put those cards down and Matt put down his cards in, and put, rolled out 13 random cards? Like, um, I, so I guess I'm confused. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm saying if I had put the cards down first and he had matched uh -huh. them, we would all be amazed. But if he, right, put, yeah, if he had laid that <laughs> same line of cards, but I had never laid any cards, we would just say that's just 13 random cards. Right? Correct. Even if it was the same yeah. lineup of cards that we had in the first example. So the right, idea sure. is probable that he would have the same 13 cards that you had laid out. Right, but he could lay those same 13 cards on another day when I'm not around and, and nobody's they would be just as improbable. Just 13. What you're arguing? Well, yeah. I'm saying that any 13 cards are going to be just as just sure. the yeah, odds no, would be the same whether they're spades so, or not yeah, spades. No, I understand. I think I understand. Uh, so my point isn't that um, the constants are are just unlikely. What we're concerned about is what results from the constants. So, um, you know, we can have 13 cards, but they just sit there and don't do anything. But um, when we adjust the constants, it's not like we have kind of the same big macroscopic picture where things just vary slightly. 
So we might have, you know, different types of stars or planets or intelligent life. Um, but things become pretty catastrophic. I mean, like if we adjust... In some cases. I mean, I... I uh, well, you, I mean, I would, I would you, argue in most cases... Okay, in most like cases... But still, uh, what difference does it make? May, maybe, this is the, maybe this is the absolute only configuration of those constants that results in anything significant. That still doesn't tell you that it was fine-tuned. What, so so let's, say, let's say a billion okay. different universes uh, attempt mm -hmm. to form over and over and over again. If this is the only right. one that could produce What got us, produced. <laughs> then it's the only one that would ever recognize right. that it's the only one that could do this. And that doesn't tell you, the fact of its improbability doesn't tell you how it came about. And in, unless you can demonstrate some agent capable of doing this, you don't get to just make one up. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, um, I guess I would kind of get into the intrinsic probabilities of theism, but um, I think I think the issue there would be not that we're just inferring design arbitrarily, but saying, okay, is this plausibly due to necessity? And then, I mean, you, it doesn't seem like anyone in mainstream physics thinks that the constants are necessary. I think uh, Paul Davies said that there's no reason to think that that's the case. Um, but then, I mean, it, it seems highly also implausible that it's it's due to chance um, as well. Is so, it the I mean, consensus think, of physicists that an intelligent designer is behind our universe? No, and I'm not saying that because physicists um, don't believe in God or... I'm sorry, I'm not trying to argue from authority. I'm just trying to say if we can reasonably eliminate necessity and chance, and those are the only two naturalistic alternatives, then I, I guess I don't see how design... How, uh, how did you eliminate by, by chance? Own right is that, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. How did you eliminate chance? It just seems unlikely. Well, I mean, Isn't that what chance is? Well, in your example, though, you, you said if you had 13 spades and they lined up that it's more likely that there was cheating involved. Yes, right? but the but only reason we, we can say that for a deck of cards is because we know there is an agent here who is capable of cheating. So that now we have mm -hmm. we have absolutely concrete confirmation that this sure. is a possible explanation. You don't have that for the universe. You can't adjust any of the constants. You don't have any other universe to experiment with. It is all speculative. And to say mm -hmm. that it just seems unlikely that to, to, to say to imply that the mere impression that it is incredibly unlikely is sufficient to conclude that there is an an agent which we can't demonstrate that is necessary and sufficient or a more probable explanation i mean that's just bizarre to me How, what, what what i don't know what keeps us from saying that it's not more plausible that universe creating pixies are the explanation I just want to throw in, I don't know if my point is completely sure. non-important or if it's mm -hmm. not being understood, because it could yeah, be that I'm, I'm not understand. understanding something. But what that. I'm trying to say, okay. no, no, not with you. I, mean, I just think all around in the conversation, I'm wondering if I'm missing something or if everyone else is missing something here. But what I'm looking at, and the reason I gave the example I gave, was to say, if you come into it with an expectation of what it's supposed to be, then you are, you are more likely to think someone cheated. If you come into it acknowledging that there is no expectation of what it's supposed to be, then whatever you turn over is, irrel is like random. You're just going to see it as that's what I turned over. And so when we get a yeah. universe where anything happens, like whatever happens, happens, the only reason that it could possibly be significant is if there's an expectation that it was supposed to be this way. And there, as far as I sure. know, is no evidence that this was like mapped. There's no blueprint that I'm aware of that shows what the universe was supposed to be before it formed. That's something we skipped over. No, that was the point of the analogy that I used during the debate was to show that it's okay. only significant because we imbue it with significance ahead of time. Right. If you think it's supposed to be this way or that it was supposed to be this way, then of course you're going to think that this is like what it was supposed to be. But there's no reason to think it was supposed to be what it currently is. And even if, even if, it, even if we were to conclude that it couldn't possibly have been anything else, that this is the only, that it was, this is a necessary universe, 
Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't tell us anything about how or why. And if we were to conclude that it's a, a chance universe, that doesn't tell us anything about how or why. Maybe we're a mistake and it was supposed to be catastrophic. Okay, so I, I guess my, it sounds like um, you're kind of saying there's no reason to go ahead and, and like start at the table with assigning significance to our current universe, correct? Yeah, correct. because that injects a bias that affects the conclusions you're likely to There's get. There's a big difference between well, shooting an arrow at a, at a target on a tree and shooting an arrow and hitting a tree and then going and painting a target around it. Right? That's an example that's been used before, yeah, but do you understand no, the agree. difference there? So if you just shoot yeah. a random arrow and then go paint a target, it's not amazing that you hit the target. Sure. So I guess I just don't think it's that unreasonable to like be concerned or uh, curious about what parameters are necessary for us to exist. I mean... No, I think a lot of people are looking into that, actually. I think that's like a fair thing for science to be examining. So, so then I guess I don't understand the point about why it would it would be uh, unreasonable for me to assign significance to the universe. I mean, like well, it, no, it's it, not. It, the idea is that you're assigning significance as as though people were supposed to be a result of it, and that's the part where you're not showing your work. It's, it's significant to us. Okay. It is not significant intrinsically. It's like I have a new truck. It's incredibly significant to me. It's meaningless to you. Or here's an example. Or it have value I have you. a cat, right? Is the product of the mm -hmm. universe potentially cats? Like, is it possible that cats were the purpose of the universe? That, per the, that one so, day I'm, we would be a conduit to produce domestic felines and that that's what was, you know, desired? My wife, my wife is nodding and saying, <laughs> yes, that is in fact the purpose of the universe. I mean, the idea so, that, that human beings are somehow the point of the universe is a really... Right. It, I mean, what Matt is saying is it may be a perspective that makes sense if you're one of the human beings, but there's a lot of things this universe does, and if you're going to say that something about it was, was preordained, why not one of those other billion things that it does? Yeah, and I think Stephen Hawking sure. said if the universe is fine-tuned for anything, it's fine-tuned for the creation of black, <laughs> black holes. Yeah. yeah, like destruction right. and vacuums. Right. Yeah. Sure. So, I think... Um, I hope I didn't give off the impression that that's kind of the dichotomy I'm painting, that either the universe exists solely for the purpose of human beings or it has no purpose at all. I mean, I think the, I think the universe could have a multitude of reasons, as you just mentioned, for or existing. Or um, and, and humans um, are just one, one point of that. The point of the fine-tuning argument is um, the existence of things, not only humans, but like planets and stars and any kind of recognizable universe uh, that we're familiar with is vastly improbable. So we should expect a universe that um, Luke Barnes has described it as something sterile, uh, sterile, lifeless, and featureless. Except um, that there would be nobody there to observe that and recognize it. Okay, if, sure, but that's if, there, are, if there are thinking beings existing, mm -hmm. Then we are necessarily in a universe that supports thinking beings, and so it should be completely unremarkable as thinking beings that we find ourselves in a universe that supports thinking beings. It's wholly unremarkable. Yeah. Even the catastrophic that, universe that, would be as unique. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know, I mean, that would be that would have its own unique parameters as well. If we found ourselves in a universe that couldn't support human life, now that would yeah, be that would be more remarkable. <laughs> that would be yeah. more remarkable, right? Yeah. Um, well, that, that kind of sounds like the anthropic principle. Mm -hmm. um, and again, Luke Barnes has said uh, something along the lines of, when we examine stars and, and the reasons they burn, um, the answer to that is because of nuclear reactions happening inside the stars. The answer is not because otherwise we wouldn't see them. Right. Um, right. And, and so, here's, a, here's something interesting. When you have little children, they tend to assign agency to things that don't have agency, if you ask them questions like, why do birds sing? Um, they will say, because it sounds pretty, right? <laughs> like they think it applies to them so that they interpret things as behaving toward them. And even something like a door shutting on their hand, they will say like, it bit me or- Although, yeah, birds, you know, birds would be agents, doors aren't. Right, but it's still what I'm saying is they interpret these things as being for their benefit. Right? Like it's done for them or done to them. Although we might be moving off to the side of, of Brian's point. So okay. I want to see if we can put a bow on this. Yeah, so I guess my point, um, it sounds like we're kind of in agreement. I mean, that, like, it's not, a, I, I'm not arguing that it's a necessary uh, component of the fine tuning argument that humans be 
the sole reason for the universe. I, I know I already mentioned that. Um, and I'm not trying to, like, assign significance just because, you know, as humans, we feel that our lives have value. So that's kind of what we need to do in order to, uh, I guess, just get on with our lives. Um, but I think all I'm trying to do is examine each uh, each possibility. Well, here's and, uh, th this is the problem then, Brian. Let's imagine we have a mystery and we want to list the possible solutions to that mystery. When it comes to I dealt out some cards, one of the possible solutions we know is possible is that I cheated. When it comes to sure. the universe, what are the known possible explanations for the universe? There may in fact be none, but if we have no justification for saying that a god, an agent, is possible, then we don't get to include it in the list of possible explanations. And until we can demonstrate that our proposed solution is possible, it's not a solution mm -hmm. at all. So I guess, um, no, I, I can agree with that, but I guess I am under the impression that most people think theism is at least possible. Um, I think so that I mean, most people think, that most people probably, well, most people probably haven't thought about this, uh, but the fact sure. that it's not demonstrably impossible does not mean that it's possible. This is something Blake and I went over over and over again. Blake, Blake's, um, Blake's well, okay. position I mean, is I that guess. if you can't show it's impossible, then it is in fact possible. And my position is that possible and impossible are both assertions that need to be demonstrated, just like mm -hmm. guilt and innocence, and you're not guilty just because we can't prove that you're innocent, and you're not innocent just because we can't prove that you're guilty, because what we can demonstrate is separate from what is. And so it may be the case that, that theism is impossible, but we can't demonstrate that. It may be the case that theism is possible, but we can't demonstrate that. But the null hypothesis puts us on the side of this is not the case until such time as it's demonstrated. Okay, so, but I mean, people have tried offering plenty of philosophical arguments for why theism should be considered possible. I mean, I guess you're just saying that you don't find those persuasive, which is fine, and I'd be interested to hear um, your reasons for thinking that, but... Um, because they guess, all they all ultimately kind of boil down, person. they all ultimately boil down to you can't prove that it's impossible. Well, I mean, I think uh, a lot of times they're just trying to draw an inference. For example, the cosmological argument, which I don't necessarily agree with, um, but I think the point of it is to it's to infer something beyond the universe. You know, had to bring it into existence, and we're not necessarily at a god yet. But once we can begin to um, give the attributes this, that this thing must have, for example, it must be uh, timeless, immaterial. None of, that then, is, none of that is part of the cosmological argument. Well, I mean, that's how it's used, like when William Lane Craig uses that argument. I know. Um, William Lane Craig uses, uses it in a dishonest fashion because the Kalam cosmological argument begins with everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist, sure. therefore the universe had a cause for its existence. There's nothing in there mm -hmm. about God or timeless or anything. It just, the whole thing is there must be an explanation for the, the reason the universe began to exist. That's it. Doesn't tell us any characteristic about that. That's all something that Craig and others add in after the fact, sometimes using other arguments, sometimes just okay. asserting it without and saying I don't have time to go through it. Well, so, I mean, if, if both of those premises were, were correct, like the universe began to exist, and, I mean, that would imply that space, time, and matter are finite, um, I guess I don't understand why it would be intrinsically unreasonable to say, okay, well, if space, time, and matter came into existence at a finite point in the past, that whatever brought them into existence cannot also have those attributes. So first of all, the first two premises are not necessarily sound. Um, there are physicists who object to them, and this is something that Sean Carroll pointed out in his debate with William Lane Craig by having Alan Bluth hold up a, a piece of paper that says, we don't know whether or not the universe, and by that we're talking the cosmos, not just our local presentation. We don't know if it's sure. eternal, but he suspects that it is eternal. Um, mm -hmm. So what we have is, it, at best, an unknown premise, which makes the conclusion uh, unresolved. 
Now you can, even, the thing is, even if the two premises were true, the only thing you have is our local presentation of the universe, our local space-time thing, uh, has uh -huh. a point in the past where it came to be. But if, right, that's if where time, I think the kind of yeah, if time is part of that, then it's absurd, nonsensical to talk about before that because there's no time. Uh, it's also mm -hmm. nonsensical to talk about something that exists absent time because existence is temporal. And we don't, I, I don't know that we have any way to find that answer. And I, I find this is curious because I'm sure there are people out there, and you may or may not be one of them, who are convinced that some god exists and started it off, but they don't know much about him. They're not advocating for Christianity or Islam or whatever. But the whole point, the whole reason people are engaged in this exercise of let's see if we can find an argument that gets us to God is because they already believe in a specific God, which is how Craig goes from the Kalam to mm -hmm. a classical theistic God to Jesus without actually connecting the dots very well. And if he, and I, if he didn't begin with this need to justify his belief in Jesus, would he cling on to the Kalam as if it were something that was going to demonstrate a God when it doesn't? Well, I mean, I think you'd have to ask him that, but I agree with you that I'd that, like to. Um, that that kind of um, chronology of argument is kind of, I think it's kind of uh, poor. I mean, um, I don't think that like a teleological argument, I'm a Christian, but I don't think a teleological argument or a Kalam argument gets you to Jesus. Um, I don't think it gets you to Christianity, but I, I think it's a good way, like I think if you were a homicide detective and you arrived at the scene, it would be important to establish that a murder had taken place before you tried to say, okay, this murder was committed by John. Yeah. So I think that, I think the argument, um, I, I, com I completely agree with that, that by the way. Creator exists. I completely agree with yeah, that. And that's my problem is the, the people who are offering up theological explanations for the origin of the universe or whatever, pick your poison, have not even mm -hmm. demonstrated that a murder took place. This is why, you know, and, and Tracy and I, I remember a lunch we had ages ago where we came up with the, uh, the courtroom analogy and I've expanded and used it and everything else. Um, I don't even think that the prosecutor has cause to bring the case before the court. You, you, you need... Uh, probable cause, you need a good reason to think that you could begin to make a case. And I don't see that theism has done that. Okay. Um, well, I mean, there, don't seem, there doesn't seem to be a lot of possibilities um, because How do you know? the universe is eternal. Well, I mean... Uh, sure, the, the universe is eternal or it's not. The, 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 sure. I mean, if it came into existence out of nothing, like in his book, Why I Became an Atheist, John Loftus says, um, he says that the naturalist maintains that the universe either came into existence out of nothing, uh, is self-caused, which doesn't make sense because it would have to exist before it existed. Um, it's always existed or it just arises as kind of a natural brute fact. But to me, I think the naturalist position, it, it ultimately rests upon there being some kind of brute fact um, of existence, like something that just exists inexplicably because I mean I think you even agreed with Blake that we can't really have an infinite regression um, we ultimately have to have some kind of foundation that doesn't have anything more foundational than itself but well it does, I in don't fact, exist I don't know for sure if there could be an infinite regress but here's the thing what's wrong and, and I don't want to confuse terms so for universe I tend to refer to our local uh, space-time tracing back to Big sure. Bang Box and then Big Bang, right. cosmos would be everything that has ever existed or will ever exist. And it could be that it's a multiverse popping up universes or whatever. Why, mm -hmm. is, it, why is it not the case that existence is just necessary and that a cosmos has always existed? Um, well, I mean, I think for the mere fact that we can imagine it having not existed, I think that's, that seems to me to be sufficient enough for I actually I don't I may I don't mean to I have I I can definitely conceive of what's currently here not having always existed but I actually have expressed 
problems with the idea of non-existence existing. That the idea that there was a, a point without existence, I can't conceive of that because in my mind that's an incoherent concept. Like to, to say that non-existence existed, I don't mm-hmm. know how to, I don't know how to conceptualize that. Not only that, the, yeah, mere, I mean, the mere fact that we can conceive of something not existing doesn't tell us whether or not that's possible. I mean, I think it may if, be a, a trick of language because I'm with Tracy. Uh, it wouldn't, if it existed, then it wasn't non-existence. It's and not if like it, there's a nothing that you could act upon. I can't even imagine a nothing. Right. What, what would it be? It, you, you can't even ask what would it be because it wouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know how to... I start really losing it when I start it, trying to conceptualize. It's like talking about something existing outside being. of time. Because it can't be. But in, in, so, I mean, in either you, case, the mere fact yeah. that we can conceive of something doesn't tell us whether or not it's likely. So, are you arguing that, um, like, an actual nothingness, you know, no space, no time, no quantum vacuum? That's um, that almost it, seems like something. Are you that that's, that's, I mean, you just gave possible? some. You just gave parameters, so that's something. I'm trying. I mean, nothing wouldn't no, even no, no, be no. descriptive. Those, those I was giving examples of something, not what I would consider okay. nothing. Because, like, okay. you have yeah, you that have would Lawrence, be something. Lawrence Krauss and Victor Stanger, who say um, they say nothing is unstable, but what they're referring to is actually the quantum vacuum. But yeah, Lawrence I mean, and I it, talked about which it. is the something, vacuum, right? Yeah, that's something. Yeah. It's not nothing. Yeah. Properties that can cause something. Right. What physicists have referred to as nothing is not the same as what philosophers have referred to as nothing. But the thing that philosophers have referred to as nothing, Tracy's saying, and I am pretty much in agreement, I can't conceive mm-hmm. of that. I mean, I don't know what, I, you can't even ask what, I, I can't, even if I say I don't know what it would be, that statement makes no sense. Because it, if, if it were, if you could apply the to be verbs to it, it wouldn't be the non existent thing or the nothing. So there's no way to even discuss it in a coherent way that I'm aware of. Okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, so I guess my question then is, like, since we can't really, it's unreasonable to say that nothing existed and then something began existing, or it, I mean, if you don't like the temporal phrasing of began, I mean, you could say, uh, well, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> well, there was, but we can't, we can't say even, even, based on our, even based on our current models, there was never a time when something didn't exist. So is that um, you're referring to like current inflationary models or? Well, it, even in our local time, in, in what we perceive as time here, if the, if the model shows that time began with the Big Bang, then there was never a time when mm-hmm. something didn't exist. But you can expand that out to uh, the cosmos and ex- excluding, you know, our, our universe, just talking about the cosmos. Um, that's still something that exists. And I find no reason to think and in agreement with other physicists that it's not in fact eternal. So you would need to show that it that that can't be eternal, and I don't know how you would do that, in order to, to right. talk about that as a beginning, which is yet another problem. But here's the thing, and I don't mean to, I'm, I'm, I promise I'm not trying to do anything weird or tricky or insulting, uh, but we're no, going okay. to move on to other callers here in a minute, but you're, yeah, sure, you're, 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 you're a Christian. Correct. I was for many years, as was Tracy, and... Okay. Um, all these interesting philosophical arguments for the existence of God. The God mm-hmm. that I believed in was real, and he had a plan, and he loved us, and he created the universe, and he sent his son to die for our sins, and blah, 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 blah. How does that make right. sense if we can't reasonably demonstrate that he actually exists. Like, we want, we want to know what's a plausible explanation for the universe. And theists or you know, Christians, whatever, theists would like to have God there as a plausible explanation, but they can't demonstrate that, it, that it's possible or that it's real, so they don't get to get, Why doesn't God fix that? Why isn't, if God has put us in this position where you and I are reasonable mm-hmm. people, and I right. don't find sufficient evidence, even though I, I used to, and I found flaws in those, um, okay. Why is it that a Damascus Road experience is good enough for, for Paul or Saul, but everybody else has got to talk about uh, mathematical possibilities messing sure. with the constants of the universe, and even that doesn't get them to God or Jesus? 
So I guess my argument for that would be, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, it's going to sound, it's going to sound like a cop out, but let me uh, get through it completely and hopefully it won't. Um, I think in order to, to, to say that God um, should, you know, appear physically to everyone like Paul's Damascus, Damascus experience, I think you would need to show that given, let's say, um, Joe, Joe has an experience, he's an atheist, and he becomes saved. I think we would have to know what happened um, throughout the rest of Joe's life. Um, all, all of the encounters he had from that point on, maybe he met with some people and, I don't know, prevented their salvation. So um, I don't know how Joe would do that, but I think we, we would have to have some kind of omniscience to know, okay, um, this, you know, if this person were to become saved, it would ultimately be better for all of humanity, but we don't, I don't think we have um, any way of determining that. I'll tell you why. I tell you why it's still a cop out because Blake has used this answer as well. Um, the idea okay. that we don't have sufficient understanding. Why can't God give us sufficient understanding? Um, I mean, I guess these are good questions. I mean, I guess it would be possible. Um, I don't know. Our relationships may be hindered if we have too much insight into. Um, God's foreknowledge. I, I really don't know. Can yeah. I ask a I mean, question? That's a great question. I, I just have a question, which is, you know, you were you were leaning a lot, and this is not just like a criticism. I'm just going to kind of springboard off of this. But you were leaning a lot on okay. the idea of if you look at all of this stuff, um, it kind of looks like a murder, right? Like it, it, what you're kind of were arguing was that it does sort of look like a murder, and so maybe we should look at. Uh, who did the murder, right? I mean, that's kind of what it boiled down to, is that you felt like the, the, when you look at it, these constants and things make you think that there may be an intelligent designer there somewhere, right? I mean, is that pretty much correct? I'm not misrepresenting you. I mean, okay, so when I no, look at the idea of what Matt is describing, and he's saying, if there's this God that really cares whether or not we understand that it exists and created the universe... Why is he making it so incredibly difficult when he has reached out and made it very simple for some folks who, with Paul, I would say that if, if we're reading that story, God seems to have really cared whether or not Paul believed in him and did certain things. And God sent him this message like directly to kind of say, here's the, here's the deal, here's what I want from you. But for the rest of us that are ha having to look at all these things that you and Matt are talking about as far as like, okay, mm -hmm. so I have to go up and read some physics and I have to go. And if, if it's that difficult to demonstrate that a God exists or that a God was involved in creating the universe, doesn't that seem to point to the idea that the God doesn't really care if we connect it to the universe or if we know that it's there? Well, I mean, maybe they care. Maybe it cares about Paul knowing, but it doesn't seem to care if I know because it's making it real hard for me to come to understand. A lot, like a lot of people aren't even going to understand what you and Matt are discussing, and so this is putting it outside of the range of most normal people that are just going about their daily business. Sure, and um, I guess I wouldn't say that. Like I think the fine tuning argument um, is absolutely necessary. I think God has reasons for. Um, putting certain people in certain situations where they'll come to believe for different reasons. Um, I think it's important for people to try and understand why they believe, but I think like the fine tuning argument specifically um, only gets you to kind of like a deistic type creator. But I think that's a necessary step along the way if you're trying to establish that Christianity is true. But to your point about, um, you is, know, it, is it actually a necessary God, God step? Made it easy. Is it actually a necessary step? I mean, if Jesus were just to appear right in front of me, I would have skipped the step about deism, right? Right, but I mean... And, and why uh, do you think that God has reasons for treating for people differently? That. Well, but even if God has reasons for treating people differently, then wouldn't it just make sense to say that if a person went through... I mean, and I know that just making sense doesn't make it you know, right, right real or anything, sure. but what I'm saying is... If somebody goes throughout their life and they never believe that a God exists, 
it seems that God mm-hmm. didn't really care to if that person believed or not. That's not one of the people that he was focused on as far as this person needs to understand and believe in me. It seems like if God wants you to do that, and if you're saying that he drives you in certain situations in order to sort of help push you along in that direction, that all the people that don't get pushed in that direction, then it makes sense to assume that God is not worried about whether or not they believe. Um, well, I think it's possible that God could have some good reason for allowing um, unbelievers to exist. Why not? Uh, maybe maybe yeah. that person. Yeah. Well, maybe that person doesn't um, personally have an interest in in you know examining the evidence for God's existence, but maybe. Um, what about people like Matt that little, examine, little, examine, little, examine, and they and they don't find it compelling? Yeah. Why why doesn't Matt why doesn't Matt find it? Well, I'm not even answer? saying why I mean, doesn't he find it compelling. What I'm saying is the fact that he doesn't find it compelling. Then, if I believe that God has this plan for each person that's individual, it seems that the plan for Matt is that he would look at the evidence, not find it compelling, and become an atheist. Um. So what was the question? With that it's one? not so much a question as does it then seem if God has this plan where he like gives people the prompts that they need in order to find him in different ways, that the people who never find mm-hmm. God, then he's not really worried about whether or not they find him. Okay, so you're saying um, if people are examining and they don't find God, then, then God is doing something wrong. God should have... No, no, I'm not saying God's else. doing something wrong. I'm saying that it seems that he doesn't... If, if he cares about a person believing and then he puts them in a right, certain direction... Not, he, he should be more concerned. No, I don't... Yeah, I'm saying that he, apparently... Sorry, you're not saying apparently the, isn't. Right, yeah. yeah. Apparently his plan for the atheists is that they just are going to not believe, and that's okay. And I guess that would go back to my point. Maybe he has... Some good reason for allowing unbelief. Um, the, my maybe problem, Matt can have interesting debates, but I don't know. My my problem here is, and you've done this, and and Blake has done this, and that's why I asked the question a minute ago. Um, you think God's got a good reason, or maybe it's possible that God has a good reason. All of those um, are built on a foundation that you're convinced there's a God, and that He knows and has plans, uh, and has a better understanding of things that we do. Uh, and you're fine with the idea that even though it doesn't make sense to you, you're, you, you trust that it makes sense to God. And what I don't understand is how can anybody be comfortable with that? Um, the idea that, yeah, that's a really difficult question, and it doesn't seem to make sense with what we know and understand about reality, but I'm just going to trust that God has a good explanation that he's not willing to share with us. Um, how is that anything other than blind faith? And couldn't you use that same excuse to justify any position and any religion? I think you could if you if you didn't have like any kind of underlying foundation. So for Christians, I mean, the foundation for belief is the resurrection. Uh, I mean, that's what what Christianity stands or falls on. So, but I mean, if if we have good reasons for thinking that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Um, but you then don't. All these questions about. I'm sorry. Well, first of all, I would argue that you don't. I mean, I've debated Michael Cohn on this yeah, I mean, as well. That, that would be but, a long conversation. But, but let's assume for a second that we had really good reason to believe that Jesus died, was buried, and came back to life. How did it happen? Mm-hmm. What's the explanation for how it happened? Well, I think you would. Um, if you're kind of hinting at maybe aliens did it or maybe there's some other mechanism. I'm not hinting uh, at anything. I'm asking how do we go about determining what the most probable explanation is and how could we ever say that a miracle from a god that we haven't demonstrated uh, is... This whole thing Tracy talked about, you know, you found a murder. What what Mm -hmm. theists are doing is claiming a murder when we have no evidence that a murder has ever occurred, or that a murder is even possible. Okay. Um, so if we so if we've never had a murder, no priors. I, this is this is Sorry. basically like one person on a planet alone is found mm-hmm. dead, and somebody wants to conclude it's a murder just because a suicide <laughs> seems unlikely. If we've got an instance where there's no demonstration, I mean, technically, we wouldn't even know what murder was. Right, so the idea of a, like a higher power, it, I mean, we don't have examples of that, so you're saying it's not like a reasonable explanation, right? 
Yeah, you don't get to just posit an explanation. You need to demonstrate that your explanation is, in fact, one of the possibilities. Not, and you can't do that by just saying, oh, it's not impossible. And yet somehow you get to this, oh, well, if we had a good foundation like the resurrection, but then my answer right. is, why, why on earth would, even if we agreed that Jesus rose from the dead, we don't have an explanation for how. You don't get to just say that, oh, it happened, and that's consistent with my God beliefs, and therefore that adds credence to my trust in God. And, oh, and it's worse mm -hmm. than that, because we don't have good reason to think that Jesus actually died and was resurrected. Um. So, I mean, I, I would take into consideration, I mean, I know you don't think there's good evidence for the resurrection, but if there was, I think we would also have to consider Jesus' own divinity claims. I mean, it wouldn't just be um, some guy being raised from the dead. It would I, be I guess my question there would be, there's a lot of things that we're assuming if we go this, these routes. Like, first of all, we're assuming that if an intelligent designer existed, this would be the kind of universe it would want to create. And I don't know that, especially if we're saying that that designer is so beyond us that we can't even conceive of it or can't even understand it or understand its motives or reasoning, then how can mm -hmm. we possibly say this is the universe it would make? And then when it comes to the idea of a resurrection, how do we know that a divinity, that resurrecting someone from the dead is something a divinity would even care about or want to do? Like, I, how can we make know, these predictions? And I don't know that if, we li if, in fact, we lived in a universe where there was a god who mm -hmm. uh, came down in, in human form in some sense and uh, had a bad weekend and then resurrected himself, I don't know how we could conclude that that is a reasonable, intelligent, or good god. Um, the, when you add in the idea of this bloodlust and substitutionary yeah. atonement, and the absurdity of coming down and, uh, you know, being a sacrifice to serve as a loophole right. for rules he made up. I don't know how any of that gets us to this idea that, oh, well, of course that's a good God. Um, a conversation that took place this weekend, and I think I'll probably have to wrap it up after this. Uh, sure. Somebody approached me w with this idea of people who were traumatized as children because they were told that you are so bad God had to kill his own son for you. Now, for me, it was very different. You know, I was, I walked down the aisle at a revival at around the age of five. I was active in a Southern Baptist church. And my perspective was, this was not, you were so bad, somebody had to die for you. It was, you were so loved that there was a willing sacrifice for you. So there's two ways of looking at right. uh, this thing. But mm -hmm. I'm finding that the idea that you were so bad that somebody had to be killed, at least for a weekend, um, is perhaps a more accurate, because if it were all about you being loved, then you could be forgiven without the weird bloodlust. Uh, what is it about the blood magic that, I know, I know the words, Oh, well, Jesus was mm -hmm. pure and perfect, and then we required a perfect sacrifice, the one sacrificial lamb that was blemish-free to serve and absorb for all of our sins. I know the words. How, right. can, how does that possibly make sense if I'm God, that I have a creation that I know is imperfect, and I'm, mm -hmm. I, I want to forgive them because they're never going to be worthy on their own, and so my best plan is to take human form and have myself tortured and killed for a weekend and raise myself up and then make the future of, of people's salvation contingent upon whether or not they accept this when the only record is written down in ancient languages that change and morph where the stories conflict such that a mere 2,000 years later Nobody could have a reasonably warranted belief that this actually occurred. At most, it would be a tenet of faith of, I am going to trust that these authors are accurately representing what happened, but we don't have evidence for it. How is that a good plan, and how is that even a good thing that I need to kill myself temporarily? I mean, none of that makes sense to me. So... Um Tim Keller has kind of an argument for why the crucifixion was necessary that I, I thought was uh, kind of interesting. I mean, it, it might not touch on, like, the the sacrifice uh, of life itself, but, I mean, 
he he says, um, you know, if I break someone's lamp, I can either just forgive them and then go without the light, or um, they can give me the money for the replacement, or I can pay for it myself. But either way, there has to be some kind of um, payment for that. So I think if I think God's uh, sacrificing of Jesus demonstrates that sin is like a it, it's a real concern for him. It's not just something um, arbitrary that he can just kind of wave off. And, and I think I think if he were to just say, "Well, I don't really care what people do," um, I, I think I mean I don't think he would. That would be a very loving God, or he would have. I, I um, care. I care what people do. I don't ever feel a need to kill somebody based on what people do. I I right, so, I don't I don't have kids, but I have family with kids. Um, I don't ever feel the need to beat kids or threaten torture in a basement based on what they do. Um, I think that you know it's it seems possible, and we can demonstrate that it happens that you can encourage right behavior um, with reason, and even when it's difficult, um, I. There's nothing that, there's nothing Tracy could do to me that right. would make me feel that I needed to kill someone to make up for it. Or that I should die for it. I, I mean, mean, what have I done in my life maybe, that I deserve Maybe to if die? she's coming at me with a knife in self-defense, I could, yeah. you know, potentially do something. But, but generally speaking, to just say, oh, and we'll do this one thing one time, and that'll make up for everything. That not mm -hmm. only everything that has happened, but everything that will ever happen. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it's a system that never made sense to me, uh, even when I believed it. Right. Well, I mean, th these are all yeah, great it, theological questions. Uh, why doesn't God answer any of these great theological questions? Is it are we just supposed to trust that He's got good reasons for not answering these questions? Well, I mean, if, if you're asking like why, like why did God feel the need to kill Jesus? I mean, I think the Bible has explanations for that you just might not find that well, no, wait, there, there was no there is no need when it comes to god right i mean god is is he bound by no i'm not saying he he has to do it in order to um you know just because he's god but maybe so he had other options right i mean he even had other plan. options with regard to the universe he would have produced he produced yeah, the sure, universe to, to do what it does right i mean everything that people do he built the universe kind of saying, this is what, this is the one I want. I want Ted Bundy to rape and murder a 12 year old. And I want Tracy to have a birthday cake when she turns 13. And I want Matt to marry Beth. And I want um, someone else. I want, uh, you know, that one woman that murdered her children, like drown them in the bath. I want her to do this. And so everything that people do, he had foreknowledge, I assume, when he produced the universe, and he chose that universe and said, this is the one I want. And then he blamed everybody for doing what he pretty much set it up so that they would do. Is that what I understand? Um, so, I mean, I agree that God had foreknowledge. Um, and was thank it, you guys so it much. Perfect? And he had a this. choice, right? He had foreknowledge of what this universe would produce, and he chose to and he had create a, yeah, that he universe. Had a okay. So then he's responsible for what he produced, right? He knew what would happen and said, this is what I want to do. Well, I mean, I, I don't think... That that seems to me like it would be kind of arguing, um, you know, parents are guilty for if they have a kid and the kid misbehaves. No, parents if, if don't they have knew, perfect let's say, let's say that I knew I wanted to get pregnant and I knew that if I had a child, it would go out and murder, like it would become the next Hitler. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to have this baby. And I right. know that this is going to happen. Did I, how am I not responsible for it? Don't I have a choice whether or not to have that child? Or let's say I could have another, a, a million different children, and I choose the one that's going to become the next Hitler. Aren't I responsible for that decision instead of choosing the one that would bring about world peace? Yeah, you, can take the kid um, out, you can take the kid out of it. If I get on my car in the freeway and I know, absolutely certain, even though I don't think we have absolute certainty about anything, but if I were, in fact, in, in, in possession of perfect foreknowledge that when I got on the freeway, I was going to fly off of a ramp 
and smash into a building and kill 20 people, wouldn't I be responsible for that action? For, uh, if, I, if I could not get in the car, but I chose to get in the car knowing what would happen, that makes me responsible. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys are making good points. I guess I would say uh, maybe God is like responsible for for the existence of the creation, but not the sin within the creation. Did he know Maybe, what I mean, it would be before he created it or not? Yeah, but for and could he choose other? Could he have chosen other universes with other outcomes? Could he have chosen a universe where you were here holding my positions and I was there holding your positions? Sure. Then, then he chose then this Then he chose one. this particular universe. And we didn't have choices. He put it into production and put it into play, and he knew what we were all going to do. He knew what Tracy would do from start to finish before she did it, and he chose for that Tracy. Yeah, if he didn't make a choice, if this was the only universe he could create, then knowing what would happen doesn't make him responsible. But the, the, the triple threat of knowing what would happen... Choosing and this particular one having consequences. and creating it, make, that's how you get to the responsibility. A no, a, an action, knowing the outcome, that could mm -hmm. have been different, means that he chose this universe. And he chose the one in which I'm destined for annihilation or hell, uh, assuming you know, I don't change my mind. Uh, and he, he Then blamed us, said we should die for it, and then yeah. killed his own child slash himself to atone for it, us. It's really weird. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm writing a book on, you know, called If I Were God, and it's one of the many right. questions that are in there, because the world that we live in does not make sense under any theistic God or notion. And that's why when we get into these conversations, um, quite often it's, well, I don't know, but I trust that God knows, which we've heard multiple times. Um, mm -hmm. heard a couple times today and I don't know that's certainly not good enough for me I am okay. troubled by why that's a good enough answer for somebody else because I remember as a kid whenever my parents right. would say because I said so um, yeah that's, that's a never a satisfying answer even if it turned out to be true even if my parents had really good knowledge and information and were doing what was in my best interest it wasn't a satisfying answer I obeyed because, generally, I'm not always, I wasn't perfect, uh, because I had good reason to think that they knew best, and I definitely understood that I was going to get punished uh, right. if I didn't. And yet, I don't have any sort of confirmation uh, like that about God. It's, it's as if theists are telling me that my mom, who I've never met and don't know anything about, has been leaving notes for me with them. Um, and they will give the notes to me, and it's all instructions for my mom, and it's all a bunch of stuff that I don't even have any way of assessing whether or not this is coming from my mom. It's weird. But on that note, we're running short of time. We've gone on for a long time. I appreciate the call, Brian. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, yes, sir. Thank you all so much. Sure. Have Take a good care. day.